call from a local realtor saying that uh, somebody may be interested in our home. Well, our home wasn't even on the market. And so, long story short, we let them into our house to take a look at it, and they wrote an offer that same day for the full asking price. But not only that, they put down a non-refundable deposit of $5,000 to close on our home March 31st of this year. And the lady has been now leasing our home for the last, since um, September, and she'll continue leasing it. So the Lord really worked that out. I wanted to be in Ecuador by the end of the year, as you'll see in the, the video I mentioned that. Now that was a little zealous on my behalf. God has his timing, I had my timing, so I've yielded to his time frame. So we're here for a couple more months. We're closing on our home in March. We still have some travels to do, and then we'll leave in mid-May. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, we're at about 85, 86% of our support level. We still have about 12 churches to be in before we leave, and so I believe that the rest of the money will come through. And so we're thankful for that. We've created great partnerships, uh, not only through prayer, uh, but just networking. We were able to um, get some plane tickets. I'm heading to Ecuador tomorrow morning <laughs> uh, with my pastor. We're going to try to secure some housing, so when we do get there, we'll have a place. But also, we're able to bring some baggage into the country. Ecuador is under embargo. It's a communist, socialist-style government. They're very anti-import. Everything is heavily taxed with duties and tariffs. And so, if I can bring two more checked bags, 50 pounds apiece, into the country, I'm all for it because um, all we get to bring is two checked-on bags when we leave. We can't pay for extra baggage. We can't have anything shipped. So when we get to the country, we're starting over from scratch. Uh, so we have set up uh, a housing setup fund and also a vehicle fund, and the Lord has already blessed uh, with that also, too. So we do appreciate your church. Uh, amen. We've supported Brother Varghese over at the Grants Creek Baptist Church uh, since I was the pastor and um, then before that in the church that I was at. And so I, I love Brother Sam, and I know that uh, this is the sending church. And so praise the Lord for your missions mindedness uh, in sending all these men on the back wall. I was looking, I know many of them. Uh, and Lord willing, if things work, we can partner together. I'm a firm believer in the team ministry. I'll be working with Brother Michael Lee. Michael Lee is in, now in Ecuador. He was in Mexico. He's a missionary that you guys support. And so uh, I met Brother Lee back in 2002. I was just a young man, newly saved uh, in 2001. I'd like to say I'm still a young man, but I was younger then. And uh, one interesting thing took place when Brother Lee was staying in my home with me. I'm from Chicago. He was visiting a church in that area. He said, Brother, if the Lord ever calls you to the mission field, you come and work with me. And now here it is, 14, 15 years later, uh, a wife and four children and however many on his hand later and experience on both of our ends, the Lord is now enab enabling us to work together. And so what a blessing that is. Uh, so we'll go ahead and show the video and I'll just um, maybe say some more things about Ecuador than afterwards. Uh, please grab one of our prayer cards on the back table um, and remember our family in prayer. I am taking four little girls to a foreign country. Okay and a wife, and they're all beautiful, you see them? <laughs> if they were boys, I might not be as nervous at times, but I know that I'm in the center of God's will wherever I am, and that he'll keep us safe and look out after us. But nonetheless, we still rely upon um, your prayers, amen. On the back of the card, you'll see we have a web page set up, and on that web page, you can go and subscribe to our prayer letter if you'd like, and about every month, every month and a half, we'll go ahead and send out uh, an update of what's going on. And so uh, if you'd like to do that, you can sign up there. So we'll go ahead and show the video now, and then I'll uh, say some more things about what the Lord's done. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eric Moore. This is my family. My wife, Holly, of 10 years, and daughters by age, Hannah, Abigail, Sarah, and Leah. In January of this year, after serving seven years as pastor of the Grants Creek Independent Baptist Church in Rising Sun, Indiana, the Lord has now called me to the mission field 
of Ecuador, South America. The call came while studying the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. Following the example in verse 10, preparations were made for a two-week survey trip in February, which the Lord greatly blessed and gave added assurance of my calling. It is now my earnest desire to arrive in Ecuador by the end of this year. The Republic of Ecuador, deriving its name from the equator, is a country about the size of Nevada with a population of over 15 million people. Divided into four geographical regions, Pacific Coastal, Andean Highlands, Amazon Rainforest, and the Galapagos Islands, Ecuador has one of the most diverse landscapes in all of South America. The capital city, Quito, is the highest capital in the world, sitting at an elevation of 9,000 feet. Quito was once the seat of rule for the Northern Inca Empire until the Spanish conquest of 1533. Ecuador did not gain its independence then until 1830. The coastal city of Guayaquil is the largest and most populous city with close to 3 million people. Two high and parallel ranges of the Andes that cross Ecuador from north to south, known as the Avenue of the Volcanoes, have at least 30 volcanic peaks with six still active. The Amazon Basin occupies almost half of Ecuador's territory, however is only home to less than 5% of the country's population. About 600 miles from the mainland lies the Galapagos Islands. This is where Charles Darwin began developing his theory of natural selection. This country, with all its natural beauty, has lives that are marred by sin that need to hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I am fully prepared to preach the gospel to the regions beyond. The Mestizos, who are the descendants of Spanish indigenous mix, constitute the largest percentage of the population at about 71 percent. Spanish is the official language spoken with small pockets of native Indians speaking Quechua, the language of the Incas. The monetary unit is the US dollar. Outside of the big cities many Ecuadorians are self-employed from farming to selling crafts to various street and storefront businesses to provide for their families. Ecuador is one of the poorest countries in Latin America with a poverty rate around 30 percent and a per capita income of less than six thousand dollars. This creates shantytown environments with high crime, drug use, and death. Even more alarming than the country's monetary facts are the spiritual ones. While on my survey trip my eyes were open and my heart was burdened for a country that is dominated by the false religion of Catholicism, oftentimes synchronized with indigenous beliefs of which 95% of the population are in bondage to. With their steeples towering over every community, along with virgin idols and patron saints scattered about, the people are truly in darkness without the gospel light. Would you please pray for us as we take the gospel to this needy people? My love and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ compelled me to respond to the Great Commission, Here am I, Lord, send me. But I'm not alone. The Lord is allowing me to work with veteran missionary Brother Michael Lee of the Mission Boulevard Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas, who is already in the country preparing for the work. The church planning model that we'll be using follows biblical principles, the team ministry, using Bible studies and building relationships to see men saved, discipleship to grow the man and build a congregation around him, then the organization of a local New Testament Baptist church which can reproduce itself. Then we repeat the process. The town of Guayabamba, just outside of Quito, will be used for our home base initially while we reach out to the surrounding areas to see who responds. This allows us to be mobile and work where needed. The goal is to reach the many provinces where there is no true gospel witness. Of the provinces that make up the country of Ecuador, only five have so-called independent Baptist churches, and only one of those churches are doing any mission work to reach their own people. The fields are not only white unto harvest, but wide open for harvest. Please pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. I ask that you would prayerfully consider how you can partner with us in this ministry. The Bible teaches us that we can pray for missions, go to missions, 
or give to missions. Would you ask, Lord, what will thou have me to do, and then obediently respond to his will? I am willing to go to the mission field. Will you go? Will you give? Will you pray? Thank you, Pastor and Church, for your consideration of our ministry. May the Lord richly bless you as you fulfill his will. questions we can address those after service if you'd like at the table and um, as I mentioned it's events when the Lord called me that Saturday evening uh, how was I to break it to my wife <laughs> and children we had a very comfortable lifestyle pastoring a church for the last seven years we had a, a home in the community and friends and family um, and so I didn't say anything to her <laughs> that evening. And then Sunday morning, I felt kind of awkward preaching behind the pulpit. And Sunday evening, like I was withholding information because I knew something that was going to change everyone's life. Because we're all intertwined to a certain extent as brothers and sisters in Christ, especially in your local church. And so Monday morning, I decided uh, to go down to Madison, Indiana and take my wife to a Salvation Army. We like going to those Baptist thrift stores and finding clothes. And, but they had a book section that I've always enjoyed. I'd find nice little gems every now and then. And uh, so I just felt this compelling desire to go. And we get down there, and I, I'm looking in the book section, and the only book that's standing out to me at the time is a bright orange travel guide to Ecuador, South America. Now, this is in the middle of nowhere, Madison, Indiana, and there's a travel guide to Ecuador, South America. And so at that moment, the, the Lord smote me, and that verse came back to my mind. After he had the vision, immediately we endeavored to go, assuredly gathering that the Lord hath called us for to preach the gospel. God just gave me another assurance that I, you need to tell your wife. <laughs> you need to get this ball rolling. Well, Holly just happened to be pushing her cart by at that time when I'm in this dumbfounded state, like, how am I going to do this? What am I going to say? And she looks at me, she's like, what's wrong? <laughs> I said, well, I'll have to tell you later. <laughs> she said, no, tell me now, what's wrong? She, you know, a good wife does that. <laughs> I said, baby, I'll have to tell you this one later. And so I, I shared with her later, uh, and um, uh, her being a, a good Christian, uh, and a loving wife yielded herself to her husband's will and that of her Lord to follow to the mission field. And then I had to tell the church. And so that weighed really heavy upon me. Uh, imagine, brother. <laughs> so then I told the church. And that evening, a church member came up to me with a check and said, Pastor, Pastor you need to go get your passport and take a survey trip. And there was just another gem of assurance. The very next week, the church gave me, um, they bought my plane tickets to go fly to Ecuador. So that was another assurance that, okay, Lord, you're in this. And then I went, and you re heard all about that in the video. And so here it is almost exactly one year later. I'm going back now to secure housing to then move in May. And like I said, the Lord has greatly blessed our time on deputation uh, with churches partnering with us, with people praying for us. And so, again, we thank you for this opportunity to present the ministry here uh, though you already do support Brother Lee, uh, if you'd like to support the team, uh, I know a good man, amen, that will be going and working with him. But um, Ecuador, like I said, we, we can't ship anything into the country. We can't uh, take anything more than the two checked-on bags and a carry-on uh, with us. And so it's, it's, um, everything is highly taxed in the country uh, as you saw, it's dominated by uh, religion, Catholicism. The town I mentioned in the video was Guayubamba, where we were initially going to move. Well, that's where Brother Lee was. He just moved in January to the town of El Quinche. El Quinche, Ecuador, is only about seven blocks by seven blocks. It's up in the mountains. And uh, when the Pope visited Ecuador before he came to America, he went to El Quinche. In El Quinche, Ecuador, there's this virgin idol 
that sits in a box in a church there that the people worship and adore. It's idolatry is what it is. And every year, I think in November sometimes, they parade this idol through the streets uh, and hundreds of thousands of people come to El Quinche to see this idol. But what I find most interesting is this is where people were responding. Brother Lee moved from Guayubamba to El Quinche because people were responding to the gospel there in El Quinche. Two Wednesdays ago, I talked to him actually, uh, I talked to him just before I came here this evening about our plans for tomorrow, but uh, they had almost 25 people meeting already on a Wednesday evening service that they are assembling in their home. And so praise the Lord for that. Pray that the hearts of the people will be open. Uh, again, our, our biggest hindrance will probably come from the Catholic Church and not the government. Uh, they still do persecute individuals there. Uh, they'll drive out their own people out of the towns, meaning an Ecuadorian preacher, because he's preaching the truth and not supporting the Catholic Church. And so remember that in prayer. Uh, obviously, it, it, this would be the devil's seat, the seat of Satan here in Ecuador. But yet that's where the people are responding and that's where the Lord has us to go. So um, again, remember that in your prayers. Uh, Ecuador has an inheritance tax right now on their people. If I wanted to leave one of my children, if I had $100,000 and I wanted to leave one of my children $100,000, they would tax it at 77%. Okay, so just to give you an idea of this is how Ecuador makes their money, through corruption, through taxes. Uh, the printing ministry is a big thing uh, for our evangelistic efforts and our discipleship efforts. Since we can't have things shipped into the country, you have to prepare it yourself in the country. Brother Lee said last year at this time, he could buy a box of ten, ten, ten boxes, a case, ten boxes of printer ink for $450. This year, only two small boxes were $250. That's how much the tax has increased. Why? Because of oil. Oil is very low. Ecuador exports oil, so they need to make up this deficit one way or another, so they tax the people, they tax the people, the people begin to revolt. And so uh, that could be a concern sometime down the road too. So please remember that in your prayers. Uh, we'll be on the equator. It's uh, next week in El Quinche. It's going to be about mid-70s in the daytime and low 50s to the high 40s in the evening time. They use the American dollar. That's only since the year 2000. This is a great blessing to an American missionary who's receiving dollars because I can go right to an ATM in Ecuador and I can pull out American dollars and I can use it in the country. Also, since the cost of living is so low, that helps us with our support level. Uh, that gives us more funds to use to do evangelistic uh, outreaches and things of that nature. Um, gasoline is a dollar thirty a gallon. Now that was pretty good when I'd mentioned that last year. Or the year, you know, if we would have mentioned it the year before here, but our gas has come down pretty low. Um, there's no need for electricity or heat because the the temperature, the way it fluctuates, the concrete buildings will. Um, heat themselves up in the daytime for the evening, then cool off in the evening. So we save on that too. So um, there's an open door and we're going through it. And if the Lord it would call any young man here or elder man to the mission field, uh, feel free to come and work with us in Ecuador. Because before Brother Lee went to Ecuador, I've been in 68 churches. I've asked every single pastor, whether they supported Brother Lee or not, have you ever heard of a missionary in Ecuador, an independent Baptist missionary? I've pastored for seven years. We've never supported a man in the country of Ecuador. I've been in 68 churches, and without fail, they've all said, no, we haven't heard. Now, does that mean there's not independent Baptist missionaries in Ecuador? No. They might be through a board. Uh, there, there's Protestant works there. There's Jehovah's Witnesses there. There's Mormons there. But where, where, where are we? We have no presence in the country. And so now here's an open door. So we're going through it. So please pray for us. Amen. I think I tried to cover all my bases uh, because I want to have time still to preach the word of God this evening to you all. Um, just a big thank you from our family to you for allowing us to present the ministry tonight. 
if you, uh, again, would like to subscribe to our prayer letter, just visit online at moreforecuador.com. And pray for us. Tomorrow I'm heading to Ecuador with my pastor. Okay, well, let's take our Bibles this evening. Please turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers 21. I love the Old Testament. I preached many uh, times at the church house books of the Old Testament. I like to expositorily preach through the Bible and deal with larger passages of Scripture in their context. And in Numbers 21, I'd like to first look at here verses 4 through 9. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And I'd like to look at discouragement tonight. Because we'll all face it at one point or another in our lives. But we need to know how we will respond to the discouragement that we face in our life. The Bible says here in verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. That's that's kind of interesting. They just said there's no bread. Wait, our soul loathes this light bread. Oh, you're not satisfied with what God's giving you. We're going to look a little bit at that too because discouragement manifests itself then in many ways. Discontentment, displeasure. Verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And what a blessing that latter end of the passage is, as we know in John 3, 14 and 15, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a blessing. But we're going to look at something else this evening. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd bless the time that we have. Lord, may my words be chosen rightly. And Father, that your spirit would open the hearts of your people as we take heed to the message. Father, you know every individual tonight and what they're facing, what discouragements or disappointments, what defeats they may have faced. And Father, you can meet each one of our needs. And we can be victorious in our Christian life if we would but have the right mindset. I pray that you would help give us in adjustment tonight through thy word. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, let's get right in. Amen. There's great, discour- there's great danger of discouragement in the Christian life. We understand that this can happen to any one of us. Um, but what I see it all boils down to, when we are discouraged because of things that are taking place in our life, whatever circumstance, trial, disappointment that I am facing, when I boil it all down, it comes back to, is God in control of my life or not? Is He the one that is calling the shots? Is He the one that has led me down this path that I find myself on to where now I become discouraged at what is taking place in my life, but yet this is what He may have planned for me all along? 
The Bible teaches us in the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. God also hath set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. Ecclesiastes 7.14 and so we're going to face many seasons in our life and many times of trial and testing in our life and we must have the right mindset to know, Lord, what are you teaching me? What will thou have me to do? What will thou have from me? These trials that the children of Israel were facing were to teach them that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And these trials that try our faith, they temper us to be stronger, to be more dependent upon Him. God knew what He was doing. Do we believe that? If we believe that, then do we believe that God knows what He's doing in our life? Because our lives are no different. God knows what's best for us. And these trials or these, this setback that the children of Israel was facing at this time was to teach them a lesson. But in the lesson that they were to learn, they became discouraged and then discontent and displeased. And they spoke out in anger. So it's time that we give rightful control of our lives to the Lord, to allow Him to accomplish His purpose and His plan in our lives. So the first thing I'd like to look at is their discouragement. In verse 4, we see here, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The, the center of their being, the soul of the people, they were discouraged because of the direction. Now, instead of marching towards the promised land, they were marching away. Why? Well, Numbers 20, verses 14 through 21, teach us that Edom refused to give passage to the children of Israel. But God was in control of that situation. God did not want his people to pass through Edom and face war or see war. He knew what was best. He had a way already planned for them and prepared for them. But it didn't line up with what they wanted. Maybe they weren't ready for war. You know, we don't know the providence of God working in our life at any given time or the life of others, though we like we think to know at times. <laughs> this is what God wants you to do. <laughs> God will lead where he pleases, whether it's wilderness, whether it's valleys, whether it's mountaintops. And the door was closed for them to go through Edom. And so their journey took a detour. And sometimes our journey takes a detour. But God was in that detour. Yet they wanted their way. They were so close yet still so far away from the promised land. Because there was going to be 40 years of training in that wilderness. And you know... When we look at the wilderness journey of the children of Israel and in any passage in the Old Testament, we can place ourselves in that position. And we can see ourselves. And this way was very difficult for them and it was very trying for them. And it was longer and it was harder to travel this way that they compassed around about. How do we react when things don't go the way we expect them to? How do we react when we might have to wait? Or it might take a little longer. Or it might be a little harder. Or it might cost us a little more. Or fill in the blank in your personal life. But just like the children of God traveling through this world, facing trials and difficulties, we have to fight the world and the flesh and the devil, and we will have disappointments. And we may become discouraged because of the way. But we need to remember, whose way is it? Is it our way, or is it God's way? For the Christian, narrow is the way, the Bible says. Does it not? Matthew chapter 7 it's a straight gate and it's a narrow way. Narrow, by the way, means to press hard upon, afflicted or constrained, restricted. Sometimes our Christian life can be restricted if we're looking at 
those on the outside. Does your walk sometimes feel constrained or restricted? Kind of tight? This narrow way the Bible teaches us has its trials and it has its hardships. Hey, listen, some faced cruel mockings, the Bible said. Some were sawn asunder. Some faced hard trials and persecution. Bonds and imprisonment. But this narrow way is different. It's not like the world's way. And we must remember that, that this is God's way. You will face opposition. The, the world wants you to be like them, but you're to be different from them. And so God has you walking in the straight and narrow. And yes, it may be restricted. And yes, it may be confined at times. But it's God's way. Are you going to become discouraged or disappointed because what you don't get to do or don't get to see or don't get to seemingly enjoy? God doesn't want you to be like them. God wants you to be like Him. Holy. Do you feel like you're making progress in your walk with the Lord? Has God led you down a path that you would rather not be on right now? It's all perspective. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Why? For thou art with me. So what is God trying to teach us tonight? You see, this disappointment in their direction produced a deep discouragement that led to an outburst of discontentment and ungratefulness to God, the one who fed them, the one who led them, the one who clothed them, the one who gave them the fire by night and the cloud by day. Listen, Christian, tonight, if you've become discouraged because of the way that you're in this Christian life, this journey that you find yourself on, be careful. Watch your mouth because it could cause you to sin. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Here we see their discouragement caused discontentment and in, in ingratitude. In verse 5 it said, um, And the people spake against God and against Moses. The preacher sometimes always faces the brunt of it because he's the one that's seen. God is not seen. He's the invisible one. And so we're going to take it out on you, Moses. It's your fault. You've led us this way, this roundabout way. And... and You've brought us here into Egypt, to, brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. No, that wasn't the intent, amen? God's plan hasn't changed yet, amen? He still has a purpose. He's still working. For there is no bread. No, there's just not the bread that you want to eat. Neither is there any water. Yes, there is. There's water out of the rock, amen? And our soul loatheth this light bread. You mean... Angels' food, the Bible called it. Manna from heaven. I would love to try some of that, amen? This sustained them every single day until they ate of the corn in the new land. They were discontent with the provision of God. And you know what, Christian? Sometimes you can say, well, it's my job, it's my house, it's my spouse, it's my this, it's my that. It's light bread. They, they said, what they were saying is basically, it's worthless. It has no substance. Oh, you want quail? <laughs> it's going to come out your nostrils. You better be careful, Christian. Do we see how this, this pattern can take place in our life? It gave them strength for 40 years. They had abundance of water. Hey, listen, Christian, have you so soon forgotten what it was like in Egypt? The iron furnace, the house of bondage, the cruel taskmasters? You've been set free if you're a Christian. You've been saved. Your iniquity is as far as the east is from the west. He's removed it. It's forgotten. It's gone. 
A new life, a new creature in Christ. Yet you, you still want the cucumber and the leeks and the garlic. And we remember what it was like. What are you doing? No, no, no. You're looking in the wrong direction. And you know what happens when we start looking in the long, wrong direction? Our body just seems to follow. It's really not that bad, is it, Christian? You're saved from hell fire. You have the one thing that everybody in this world is looking for, but they're looking for it in all the wrong places. And they're drugging it out and drowning it out and whatever people are getting involved in. They were ungrateful of God's daily provisions. Discontentment will lead to forgetfulness and ungratefulness. Listen, don't get discontent. You, you have more. If we put things in perspective, we have more than three quarters of the world living here in America. We're going to a very poor place in Ecuador. Very, very poor. But there's poorer places than that. And we whine and we complain and we forget, wait, look at what God has already done for you. Look at what he has already provided for you. And so we speak out against loved ones and their goodness towards us, whether it's the Lord and, and his great blessings or our pastor or our spouse or our parents or our children. God was doing something here. They, did, they, couldn't, they couldn't see it. They couldn't realize it. Because they weren't looking at the bigger picture that he was in control. And he led them out. And listen, Christian, he, he brought them out to bring them in. God was humbling them. He was proving them according to Deuteronomy chapter 8, 15, and 16. Listen, the trials in your life right now, Christian, are they making you better or bitter? It's all about perspective. How are you looking at it? The choice is yours. Destruction or deliverance. Not that it's, these things aren't going to happen, but when we recognize it in our life, then we need to choose to do right. And we need to choose to understand that God's in control and that he has a greater plan and a greater purpose. And I might not be able to see everything, but he knows what he's doing. Oh, and by the way, I'm saved. <laughs> and so, even if the worst of the worst of the worst could happen in my life, I've been delivered from so great a death, the Bible says. And so have you, if you've been saved. Look at God had enough. You see what happened? Verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. You know what I find very interesting? Is the serpents were all around them anyways. But they did not strike until Israel struck. God stayed those serpents. But you know what? They spoke out. All right. If that's how you want it. Let's take this lesson a little further now. The Lord sent the fiery serpents, the Bible said. The Lord, the loving God, our Father, sent the fiery serpents. God can show you how bad it really is. God chastens us because he loves us. And that's what he was going to do to his children now. Listen, Christian, you will be judged when you sin. And will we yield to God's correction in our lives or will we fight against it? Will we let that poison, as it, the, the fiery serpents, when they bit the people, they died? Will we let that poison run its course and kill us like bitterness and unforgiveness and ungratefulness? Some are bitter against God because things haven't turned out their way. But what about God's way? We've been bought with a price. We are not our own. We belong to him, 1 Corinthians 6 says. Listen, Christian, tonight God is for you. He's not against you. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants your life to be blessed. But remember, he's in control. And shall he not do with that which he pleases?
Is there sin in your life that needs to be repented of? Are you murmuring and complaining against God's blessings in your life? Or against the correction God's trying to give? Don't fight it. Has a root of bitterness taken hold? It's time to root it up or it'll destroy you. Number seven, or verse seven, number three, their deliverance. Verses seven through nine. What a blessing, amen. We have sinned. Just confess, Christian. Just confess. Listen, we have sinned. They realize that this is happening because we have sinned. Listen, to open your eyes, it's because you've sinned. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. They made it right with the man of God, too. They made it right with him. Well, I asked God to forgive me. Well, maybe the person you wronged too, you need to seek forgiveness from. And against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the servants from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, and we know the story and what happened. Amen. Our deliverance comes when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who was lifted up and crucified. The one who suffered and bled and died in our place. For our sins, when we look to Him, we can be made whole. We can be delivered from our discouragement, from our discontentment. They realized that they spake out, then they repented. Why? They said, we have sinned. They sought forgiveness. They confessed. They took their eyes off themselves and they looked to the one that the Lord provided. Listen, Christian. When you're discouraged or discontent, it's because you're, you're looking in the wrong direction. Look to the crucified one. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to God, amen. Get in the word of God and find some help. Don't yield to discouragement. Think on the promises. Think that all God has done for you. Be fully persuaded that God is in control and that his way is the best way. Stay in that straight and narrow and see God's hand do marvelous things in your life. This too will pass. They made it through, you know. Just like other numerous trials we read about in the book of Numbers in Deuteronomy. They'd complain and, you know, they had to drink bitter water and just six miles down the road was fountains of water. They didn't even realize it. This too will pass, Christian. Life is cyclical. We read about cyclical things in the Bible. But let's try to even it out a little bit, amen? Are you discouraged tonight? Are you discontent? Are you disappointed? Ultimately, it's against God. Because His hand is the one that's leading you. His hand is the one that's feeding you. Would you repent and make it right if it's wrong? Keep your eyes on the prize. Press toward that mark. Do you know him tonight? Has there been a time in your life where you repented of your sins and gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? The one who could save you from your sin? Have you been born again? And do you know for sure? If not, seek his face. Judgment is coming. All will be there. Would you tonight respond to the truth as we close? Pastor, let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, this evening for the scriptures. Thank you for this brief challenge concerning discouragement and discontentment. Father, you've promised us you have never leave us nor forsake us and you'll walk with us on this path that we're traveling. I pray that you would help us to have the right attitude, an attitude of gratitude for all that you've done. May we look forward and not back. May you help us tonight, Lord. Deliver us from these evils. Bless this time now, in Jesus' name we pray.